Thank you for the invitation and uh, I'm uh, happy to be on the uh, this. This is part of a larger project where we try to understand why the Arab Spring um, was, uh, the protests of Arab Spring were, were uh, launched in several cities, not another. In each country, we, we found that some cities revolt before the others, so some cities are closed, and we understand this variation within this each state. I'm, 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 what I'm trying to say, uh, to present here is, why there is a presentation, uh, there is a, dip, a variation in the protest within this area. So this is the empirical puzzle. In, in Arab Spring context, most of the protests uh, concentrated in two regions, Qatif and uh, Raida. Uh, in Qatif, we have these dates for each date represents one uh, protest. We have in Qatif 2011 several protests in 2011, in Buraida several protests in 2012 and 2013. And the question is why we this uh, protest concentrated in, 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 in those two cities. Main explanations that focus on a mass grievances um, fail to account for such a variation in, in protests within within country. If it is the poverty or if it is uh, uh, any mass grievance within the country, then we expect that most of the cities will revolt at the same time. But we see that there is a variation within the probability of, uh, of uh, protest within the state. Especially there is, there is, uh, there is an, also an, an additional element about this weird variation in protest that it is not only focused within the Arab Spring, it is historically that these two cities are the most protesting cities in this area. For example, Buraida, there is 1993, Buraida and Fala. In 2007, there is also Buraida prisoners uh, protest. Also in Qatif, we have 1979, Qatif uh, and Fala. In 2009, we have Qatif. So these cities have something that uh, in common that makes them continuously protest against the state. But surprisingly that in the literature about Saudi Arabia that we don't notice the common elements between these cities. And I, I, I think that there is some paradigm within the Saudi literature that makes these kind of variation went unnoticed. I call this paradigm as a two sectarian world paradigm. Somehow in the Saudi literature, we imagine Saudi Arabia as a, as a two world. The yellow one here is the Shia world, and the green one here is the Sunni world. What happens in the, Sun, in the, in the, in the yellow world is, can, be, can be explained by sectarianism. Revolts in Qadif because of the Shia. Whatever what they do, that because of the Shia. Shia, Shia identity explains everything in, in the Eastern region. Despite the fact that there are some Shia regions that they don't revolt. And, and for example, I, I, I have, I have uh, Toby's uh, book as an example. Uh, sorry. But uh, the, the fact that the, the, the factual, uh, the empirical facts that we have Shia dispersed into, in, in three cities, in Qatif, and in Hassa and in Medina Munawar. But the revolts are concentrated on Qatif, historically. Especially in his book, most of the protest and uh, political story that he provided, it's, it's concentrated on Qatif. There is some elements in, 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 in Hassa, there is some story that told about Hassa participated on, on, on this, in these uh, protests, but mainly most of the actors, most of the political organizations are uh, from Qatif people. Same thing with the, with the Sunni world. Everything happened, each protest that happened in the Sunni uh, regions of Saudi Arabia are explained by Islamic ideology or Islamic movement. <coughs> Stephen Lacroix books is an example of that. He, he noticed that there is an, an, an attempt an, an antifada in Buraida and also an attempted protest in Riyadh, but it failed. But he doesn't explain why it failed in Riyadh and, and was 
successful or at, at, at a cold in, 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 in Borrego. And the reason for that, I think, that these kind of works on Islamic ideology and Islamic moves for, for, want to explain why art emerged in Saudi Arabia. They are answering questions that uh, concern the Western uh, uh, concerns. They want to see what are the domestic, intellectual, and domestic uh, historical context that led to the emergence of apartheid. That's why they are not interested that much on such variation that I'm trying to understand. So what's the explanation I'm trying to uh, uh, br uh, bring as an alternative of uh, these uh, kind of things? My argument is simple, that some regions have strong identities more than others. And people in regions with strong regional identities are more likely to be mobilized than others. So it's about regional identity and regionalism. <coughs> I will go step by step on how I build this theory. I will start with Taimur, uh, Taimur Quran theory. Taimur Quran theory is, uh, he says that in, in, in authoritarian regimes, individuals engage in what he called that uh, self-falsification. What he means by that, that each individual has two preferences, a private preference and a public preference. In his public preferences, he, sub he, sub he supports the regime. In his private uh, preference, he might be against the regime. If he has these two preferences, then he engages in what he calls that self, uh, 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 self falsification. By this, he means that an, an, an individual will participate in a protest if the two conditions occur. One, that the first one is if other individuals show that he, they share him the same kind of preference against the regime. The second one, that he is, uh, his, his ability to withstand living in psychological and schematic life uh, is lower than others, it's high. So if he's, he can't withstand his, himself with keeping his private uh, uh, preference uh, private, then he will uh, join the protest. I add two modifications to this theory in order to make it applicable to Saudi Arabia. The first modification is that authoritarian regimes vary in their attitude toward freedom of expression. In Saudi Arabia, in, in Quran theory, the, the authoritarian regime that he describes is the, the freedom of expression is totally uh, monopolized by the state. But in Saudi Arabia, the freedom of expression is not that monopolized. I call it that the Saudi regime dominates, but not mobilizes the media. The, the, the domination of the media prevents any counter, uh, uh, counter narratives with, that can spread nationwide. But it allows for counter narratives to be uh, spread locally or spread within elites, within intellectuals, but it doesn't allow for a, a, a wide public counter narrative. The other the other uh, thing about the Saudi regime with, with, and its attitude toward freedom of expression is that I call its method of repression as situational. That it is not the content of speech but that drives repression, but who express it and when and through what media. Two, two Saudi people might say the same thing. One got jailed and another uh, the, uh, the doesn't. And the reason for that is the status of that person, how influential is he, where he said what he said, that uh, makes the uh, repression decisions uh, vary regardless of the content of the speech. The second modification is that for Quran, because he, uh, Quran, because he's an economist, he understands preference as an individual's time fixed. He assumes that each individual has fixed private and public uh, um, uh, preferences. But, but for me, I think preferences that is products of individual interaction with specific social context. And it is continuously shaped and reshaped by groups and movements. But by adding these two modifications, I say that in an authoritarian regime where freedom of speech is controlled situationally, the existence of a strong collective identity will influence the possibility of protest occurrence. And I assume that this kind of collective identity is the regional identity. And the reason for that is that because it's territorially, territorially concentrated, that territorial aspect of regional identity helps 
uh, people to make uh, to have the focal points. I mean that they will they will, that when they said we belong to such an, uh, a city or such a place that this uh, is fixed and it is easily imaginable within them and that will help to enhance the uh, ability for them to act collectively. So, if this is the case, then why some regions have stronger identity than others? Uh, for, for, uh, the first thing that regional identities are, are like any other identities, yeah, that I work with. by that I mean that they are socially constructed. And normally when we study regional identities that we understand them as the signs of failed national integration. For me, I understand that they are products of the state-making process itself. And I will highlight two state processes that helped to the uh, 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 formation of such a uh, regional identity. From James Scott, that no state making without state naming. Uh, by this, Scott means that the state itself needs some kind of knowledge that needs to name, standardize, standardize uh, uh, many things within its realm in order to help to identify people, identify places, to make its action more effective and more simple. This naming process by itself makes some local knowledges durable and others not. For example, the, the, I, will, I will highlight two state, for, state processes, state naming processes. The first one is the state administration division of the country. The country is divided into oh my, 13 regions, I think. These regions are not the names of these regions and the name of the cities within these regions uh, are not equal in, in respect that they don't necessarily reflect local knowledge. For example, some regions are arbitrarily constructed without any local meaning or local meaning. For example, the northern here, the northern uh, borders, it's called the northern borders. It has nothing. It, 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 its meaning has relevance to the central power. But for the people inside that people, they don't identify themselves as northerners or northern borders or something like this. And the regions, oh, the, and the other kind, kind of regions are for formed after the state's formation. And this applies for most of the oil towns, like Arar. Arar has a funny story why it's called Arar. It is, it is, it is, it, is, it, is, it was uh, founded, uh, the tab line, the Aramco was built the tab line from the eastern region to Lebanon. And one of its uh, stations, uh, there was a, uh, an oil tank, it's called Arar. And they call it Arab. But that's why they call it Arab. Uh, the third kind the type of regions that are located in and named after towns that are existed before the state, such as Jeddah, Riyadh, Mecca, Buraida, Qadik, these are cities and towns that has name, a history before the state formation. And and the state by naming them by the same name that the people identify with, that they help to endure that they, their history, their identity with it. That doesn't mean that the boundaries of these, the, the modern boundaries of these cities as, as identical to the historical ones. For example, the size of historical real is much, much smaller than the current real, but it has the same in, uh, endurance. But if you, some, some can write about the history of real, he will claim a region such as the Ria as part of real. But uh, the, the point here is that by naming it by the same name of the people who live in it, it helped people to identify with it and give them sense of continuity, historical continuity. The other state process that has some uh, help to uh, make regional identities and construct regional identities is the identification card. In, in, in identification card, there, is, there are different information, the name of the individual and the place of birth. The place of birth tells a lot about who is the guy, who is the, the, this guy and where the kids come from, and help to be able to Im imaginary identify with these people. Uh, as, an, uh, as an anecdote, I went once through a checkpoint and he, the guy in the police who see my ID and he found that I'm from Brida and he's from Brida, he 
to treat me differently from others. Just he doesn't know me personally, but just you know, see the name of the indication. That helps to uh, he assumes that we are in a imaginary, com imaginary community that we have some some common things that we will treat me perfectly than others. Um, these state policies are not by themselves the cause for the construction of regional identity, but they helped, uh, they laid the ground for such identity to be created. They accompanied by uh, some intellectual projects, some of them sponsored by state, some of them are done privately, such as one of them is This Is Our Country, which is a series of books that the uh, presidency of youth uh, 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 published. Each book has uh, uh, a story of, uh, of one town. And the other project is the Geographical Education of Saudi, Saudi Arabia was uh, led by Hamad al-Jassi, which, which is a well-known intellectual and historian, uh, Saudi historian. And he assembled a group of historians to write about the geographical dictionary of Saudi Arabia. Each, 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 each uh, part of this uh, series has a name. So, for example, there is a, a, ge a geographical dictionary of Qasim, uh, geographical dictionary of Sharqiyya, uh, uh, they call the bah uh, Bahrain, so Sharqiyya I mean uh, Eastern region. And there is an individual project, such as a book about history of Jezan and stuff like this. These kind of books and, uh, and intellectual products helped for the people to identify uh, with their region. They created a history for their region, a history that is independent of the state history, a narrative that uh, tells a story for each town that has its own uh, significant role in all what happens in Arabia since the uh, pre-Islamic period until the modern period. And this kind of narratives with the state uh, division of the of territory and uh, and some region have their their own dialect and their own uh, names and and and, uh, and means of identification such as marriage and stuff like this that all helped some regions to have stronger identity than regional identity than others. So that all, not all regional identities can monopolize mobile population. Some witness large domestic migration. By this, I mean uh, cities like uh, Jeddah, Riyadh, Mecca, they have witnessed some large domestic migration that prevented these cities from uh, help, from uh, helping any uh, collective action within these cities. Uh, new residents in these towns, that th th those new immigrants who came from different regions within Saudi Arabia, do not give up their previous tribal and regional identities, because these kind of identities are helpful for them to get jobs, to get married, and to get reside within the country. And members who are identify with the regional identity become uh, become minority, uh, become minority within their city. For example, Jeddah people who are from historical Jeddah are now minority in Jeddah. People who are from historical Rial are minority in Rial. For example, Rial population was 83,000 in 1950, and now it is 4 million. That, uh, uh, these are, most of these people are coming from different regions. This prevent any uh, ability for people within the city to uh, act collectively or identify with the city or as, uh, adopt the same regional narrative within the city. So we are end up with a small number of cities that has uh, the ability to uh, develop such a regional narrative. I will compare it for, for five regions and to, to show why Brighton and Adif has some uh, rule on the, the The first here, Brighton, Adif, Riyadh, and Man Hijaz. Uh, and Qadif and Riyadh and Hijaz are founded before this. Before, before the Saudi state, we had some regions that they called Raid and Qadif, Riyadh and Hijaz, but we don't have the Man. The Man is a, an oil town that was constructed after uh, the formation of uh, Saudi Arabia. And some of these has large domestic migration, such as Riyadh and Hijaz, but Qadif and Raid, they didn't witness the same amount of domestic migration. They have foreign migration within, the, the foreigners are normally living segregated 
the, the, the uh, neighborhood that uh, uh, that allows the people who inhabit uh, the Saudi people who inhabit the cities to uh, forge their own identities, regardless of the existence of the foreigners, uh, and administratively, administratively recognized, right? But they are administratively recognized, but area and also the other man, but Hijaz no, and that will prevent the Hijazi who who, who want to uh, uh, claim anything about Hijaz. To, 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 they will have to engage with discussion. Where, where is the ball? What is the borders of Hijaz? When Hijaz starts, when Hijaz ends, and this will be continuously uh, a debate within anyone who will claim an, an Hijazi identity. But for Qadif and Qurayda, this is solved. Qadifi people now, when they call for the Qadifi protesters, when they call for a republic of Qadif and Hassa, they draw borders of the administrative uh, borders of Saudi Arabia. The, the, the same administrative board that allows them to 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 claim something that exists, but for regions such as uh, uh, Al Slimani, which is Jazan and parts of uh, Najran, so they, 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 it is possible for them. Uh, it's not impossible; it's difficult for them to claim such uh, regions. Uh, yeah, I will uh, finish. In 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 Moraida, I believe the same thing happened. Local histories were written by historians. We have um, Muhammad al Salam wrote a book about the history of Qadif. We have Muhammad al Ribi wrote a history about Moraida. These are examples. There are many other books that read. These they 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 they, they, they have similar narratives. They have some mythical foundation story that there are people who founded this city, these uh, these cities. They are not Bedouin. They are Hadari. They emphasize the Hadari element the, uh, of these the foundation of these cities. They when they narrate the history of these localities, they focus on how other people resisted the uh, Bedouin raids against them, and they emphasize the role of members of the within of, from these cities in major conflicts, international and regional conflicts. For example, if you read a book about, from Muhammad al you will see Qatifi would play a huge role in, in many things happened in, in the history of uh, Arabia. And if you read the um, Ribdi book, you will see the same thing. Uh, this, this is the final. Yeah, this is the final slide. Sorry. Uh, in, in regional identity in action. I will focus on two examples here. The first one is the Medina incident. Medina incident uh, in, in 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 two thousand eight or something like. It is the the Shia went to Shia, Shia from Qadif went to uh, Medina. They commemorated the, 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 the Prophet's birth. The, they were attacked by the state police. Although that it has happened in Medina, Shia and Medina did its protest. Shia and Hassan did its protest. The protests were happened in, in Qadif. And this shows that, that, that the regional element here plays a significant role. Because we, if, 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 if an incident happened in a place, we assume that the people within that place will protest. If we adopt a sectarian explanation, then the Shia of Medina will protest. Like, but the protests occurred only in, in Qadif, not in Hassan, in Qadif. And many regional actors in Qadif adopted the case, the, 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 the case for the Medina uh, incident. The other story is the prisoners. And after 2003, Al-Qaeda launched a campaign against the, the Saudi state. Saudi state responded by mass uh, arrest for people from different regions. but. The families of the, the prisoners in Raida protested this, uh, against the, the, the state, but the, the families in other uh, regions they didn't show the same uh, activist rule in protesting the, the state's imprisonment of their relatives. We have the same cause, but some regions uh, protested in a way that it is uh, different than others. Even the protests that occurred in Riyadh for the prisoners' family are organized by people who are linked directly for 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 to to Brida's family. So they are from Brida's family. They are have Brida origins. <coughs> so this kind of variation, while we see the same cause, cannot be explained either by sectarian identity nor by ideology. This is 
uh, the, the, the last thing, this is, uh, thank you very much, but this story, this uh, uh, photo, these are women protesters in Qadif saying that we are in support with women protesters in Qadif. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sosa. Um, now we move to our third uh, presenter, uh, Andrew Hammond, is a doctor candidate at the University of Oxford. Um, Andrew um, is working on um, um, interactions between Turkish and Arabic language ulama and intellectuals in the early 20th century, including their role in the development of Salafia. Um, the title of his uh, presentation is Producing Salafism from Invented Tradition to State and Prop. Well, uh, Salafism, big uh, topic, but um, I think it's, uh, it's presenting itself in a large way in the last uh, 10, 20 years or so as uh, the expression of uh, normative Sunni Islam in, in belief and practice in a large way. Um, the term has made its uh, way into uh, public discourse in English, uh, I think in a big manner since 9-11, essentially. Um, and although it has been around uh, in Arabic uh, for much longer, uh, it's, still, it's still a vexed term. Um, I think it still has a lot of problems. Um, I just want to discuss some of the problems in its genealogy its meanings um, and its role in the Islamization to a certain degree of uh, what we could call Saudi foreign policy, um, if, if there is such a thing even. Um, in terms of its meaning, um, it's understood today as, a, as this, this referent to those who follow the path of the first uh, three generations of Muslims uh, who are imagined to have lived uh, closer to the, uh, to the Prophet and therefore are uh, ref reflective more of the, of the divine message. Um, although, of course, the term could be understood in, in many ways in itself, uh, Salafi could simply refer to those who are of that generation, um, or those early generations, while the use of the term Salaf uh, doesn't necessarily mean that someone self-defines self himself uh, as a Salafi or identifies with something called Salafia. Um, I think in some of the discussion of this, there's been a uh, uh, a tendency to kind of take a modern meanings and project them back into the past when interpreting. Um, so in the 19th century you do find quite a, a bit of discussion of the term Salaf itself, more than there had been previously um, in the Islamic intellectual tradition, and even with Salafi itself, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those using the term uh, were referring to themselves as Salafiyin or thinking of themselves as belonging to something called Salafia. There's also a tendency I think to um, uh, connected with uh, proto-pan-Arabism to a certain degree as well when looking at the 19th century. Um, I think there's a more critical eye has been uh, cast over the topic in the last couple of years by uh, Frank Griffel uh, in an article, Henri Lozier and the Khaled um, I think, uh, in essence, I would say we're not really talking about the, uh, the emergence of uh, Salafia or Salafiyin in, in, in any kind of modern sense and, and its usage in, 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 no sense, in no senses until the early 20th century. Um, in, in, in essence, I think Rishi Grida uh, joins together three groups, I would say, uh, none of which actually themselves refer to themselves as Salafiyin or said we, we champion something called Salafia. Um, the, the first being um, Muhammad Abdu and this mo movement that, that I think we correctly term as modernist. Uh, secondly, the movement which was uh, critical of the tradition of the schools, the Madahib, um, and was uh, against the idea of taqlid of uh, certain schools, um, and moved, to, to moved towards even the sense of trying to get behind the uh, tradition of the schools in Islamic history. Uh, before the Madahib completely. Um, and thirdly, uh, Wahhabiyya. Um, they, all, they all overlap to a certain degree, but I think, uh, I think uh, we could say that there, these are three separate trends. Um, but what, what does happen is that uh, one of them falls away in subsequent uh, uh, decades, um, from the, say 1920s, 30s, 40s, and two coalesce. The one that falls away is that of the modernists and uh, Muhammad Abdu, 
And the two that come together is the anti-school position and Wahhabia. Um, we could say that that makes sense. It was inevitable, let's say, because they share uh, the critique of uh, what Jonathan Brown calls the late, late Sunni traditionalism. Um, they are anti-Sufi, uh, in the intellectual culture of Sufism, some of the practices, popular practices, uh, the Ash'ari domination of, uh, the, of, of theology and the culture of the schools. Um, but at the same time, uh, you could say that uh, Abdul and the anti-schools group, uh, in a sense, were made sense as people who were, who were closer together. If uh, you think of uh, someone like Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, um, who was close, uh, close to, the, to the people like Abdul. Um, closer than, these two were closer to each other than they were to Wahhabia. But it, it did emerge that Wahhabia and uh, the uh, anti-Taklid uh, group uh, coalesce. Um, in, uh, in essence, from the 1960s, in, 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 within Saudi Arabia. Um, but still, you have the, the interesting fact that, say, 1938, Hassan al-Banna could, could refer to the, the Brotherhood as a Dawa Salafiyya, Tariqa Sunni, and Hatika Sufiya, but uh, still at that time. But then, a couple of decades later, Hassan Tumam, or even recently, Hassan Tumam was able to write of uh, the Salaf al Khan al-Muslimin. It had, had, had Salafized, because our understanding of what Salafi is has simply shifted, and uh, uh, we don't think of now the Brotherhood as being in, in any sense Salafi, but we can say it became Salafite. So the meaning shifted in the modernist sense of what Salafism is, did, essentially disappeared. Um, I think, uh, so if, if, uh, there are three stages in a sense of, uh, of uh, how the meaning uh, developed. Um, the, the first being the early 20th century, that's been the second in Saudi Arabia of the 60s, and a third uh, of the 1990s, the globalization era, when we start to uh, discuss it in the sense of uh, transnational Salafism. And uh, Roel Mayer was able to uh, um, uh, categorize in his book uh, Global Salafism, he talked of uh, Salafism as Jihadiyya or Tanzimiyya or Yalmiyya, um, which I think is a definition or a classification that reflects uh, the, the, how things have, have, have developed since the 1960s when the anti-schools and, and Wahhabism came together within Saudi Arabia. Um, because, for example, if you talk about Salafi al Mia, um, which normally gets translated even as a quietist, it actually covers two groups um, who would not share this position on, uh, on the schools. Um, uh, but they might agree on other things. They agree on that they, they, they don't want to politicize, uh, they don't agree with them, uh, political activity, um, and they have a position against the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, but they might not agree on this uh, question, which I think is more fundamental about the schools. Um, in Saudi Arabia, um, I think its trajectory is more troubled than, than uh, we might imagine. Um, quite often it's said that in 1929, Abdul Aziz, in a speech, he had uh, um, embraced uh, Salafism as a term, um, seeing what Ra Rashid Rido was doing in terms of how he looked sympathetically towards Wahhabi and wanted to associate it with uh, this notion of Salafism that he and some others had essentially invented. Um, uh, in that, there's a speech, uh, this is cited uh, sometimes uh, to a, it comes from a speech that he made in 1929. Um, it's in the Omar uh, Qura uh, newspaper. Um, in the speech itself, he, he, he doesn't actually say that uh, we are Salafis or we believe in something or follow something called Salafiyah. He does talk about Salaf as Salah, which in itself is not that unusual, of course. Um, but he is ex explicitly trying to reject the term Wahhabiyya. Um, and in the context of what Rashid Rida had been doing, I think it, he probably was directing himself to or trying to connect Wahhabism to Salafism, but without being so direct. And I think that's telling for how uh, the Saudi Arabia as a state and religious establishment, the official establishment, looks upon this term um, uh, through the rest of the 20th century. Around that time as well, quite often it might, you might hear references to a read reference to a Tariqa um, Salafiyya. The, the, the sense of it being used is it's a, it's a reference to the Salaf themselves. It's not a reflection of how people are describing themselves um, within Saudi Arabia or the religious establishment. Um, I think things shift um, from the 1960s with uh, essentially with Al Albani uh, going to Saudi Arabia, and he he, he takes he takes on the term in a far more aggressive and proactive sense um, uh, from within Saudi Arabia when he went to work there, um, and he also takes he also is more aggressive in the sense that it's not simply taqlid or being against taqlid of the schools, he's also suggesting that we can go behind this tradition of the schools completely as well. 
Um, and in that sense, it becomes to be referred to by others, by critics of Albani in his position as Lama Thabia. Um, uh, and I think that becomes a problem in Saudi Arabia because uh, Albani is being critical, as uh, uh, others have noted, he's being critical of, uh, of Wahhabism itself, and he was critical of uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab, um, saying that he wasn't completely a Salafi because he may have been Salafi in Aqidah and in a belief of theology, but he wasn't in a fiqh because they were uh, beholden to the uh, Hanbali uh, uh, fiqh school. Um, so I think the term travels uh, slowly, uh, more slow than uh, than we think, and it remains con uh, connected to Albani. So, if, I mean, looking at uh, literature through the period from the 60s, 70s, 80s, you find that the term itself is not actually um, that prevalent. Um, one of the major critics of Al Albani's position, uh, Muhammad Zahid al kawthari a late Ottoman uh, religious scholar who went to Egypt uh, during the uh, Kananist period and lived there uh, until through the 50s, or early 50s, um, he, he was a very big critic. He refers to this as Lama Thabia. He never talks about Salafism or Salafia. Um, looking inside Qutb, he doesn't talk about Salaf or Salafia. Uh, one of the other major critics of Albani, uh, Said Ramadan al Boti, in his refutation from 1969, he doesn't use the term either, and he refers to it as Lama Thabia. Um, although when he goes back to the topic uh, 20 years later in the uh, late 1980s, he does refer to it as Salafia. When he called his book as Salafia, Marhala Zamaniya, Mubaraka, La Madhab Islami. Um, at the same time, a follower of Albani, like uh, Abu Muhammad al-Makdisi, he uses the term liberally in the 1980s. And uh, the Egyptian uh, religious scholar Muhammad al-Ghazali, uh, in his book uh, from 1989, which attacked this movement, which now he was able to term Salafism, he attacks it by name, uh, he attacks it uh, as a, as a uh, they were, he attacks it quite strongly and it elicits a lot of uh, uh, opposition from within Saudi Arabia, but he uses the term Salaf Salafia in that book. Um, in terms of the, uh, the religious establishment, the official scholars, um, it doesn't seem to be embraced uh, with much enthusiasm. It's discussed to a certain degree, but not in, in any enthusiastic uh, manner. Um, the permanent fatwa committee, when Bin Baz was in charge, uh, res in response to a question, simply, simply noted that the meaning had advanced to, uh, to designate those who follow the way of the Salaf. So it shifted from meaning the Salaf themselves to meaning those who follow the Salaf. And he was simply acknowledging that. Salah al-Fawzan, uh, he said the terminology of Salafia is okay, the but um, if it's used properly. Um, so that, that you don't get a sense of much enthusiasm. The uh, Majma' al Fiqhi al Islami uh, of the World Muslim League, based in Saudi Arabia, they issued a decision in uh, 1967, which condemned, uh, 1987, sorry, which condemned the Ta'asub al Mathabi, this over loyalty to the schools. Um, but they also condemned being against the schools, Lema Thabiya, as a hateful method, Wasluq Bahid, um, which uh, misleads and divides. And they repeated this again in their, their, the journal they put out, they repeated it again in uh, 2005. So I think um, there's an acceptance of the Albani position if it simply means uh, shifting between the schools as a criticism of Taqlid. But when it gets into this harder position, which is Lema Thabiya, which tries to get behind the whole tradition of the schools, um, to the earlier period of, of, of uh, Islamic history, uh, then there's a problem. Um, at the same time, of course, the, 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 the standard position would be that uh, the Wahhabi message is not something new, it's renewing. It's not Mubda, it's Mujaddid. So we don't really need this term anyway. Um, however, it does prove useful. Um, and I think it proves useful, becomes, become, it starts to become quite useful in, in uh, the context of uh, foreign policy. Um, the idea of foreign policy uh, uh, instrumentalizing Islam, it doesn't really happen, of course, until the 1960s. Um, uh, but even uh, in 1980, early 1980s, uh, there was a question in, in Western discussion of uh, Saudi foreign policy about whether there was even such a thing as, as an Islamic foreign policy at all, which is something James Piscatori wrote in 1984. Um, but there had been something, obviously, that uh, there was a shift in attitudes definitely from that period because you had these threats to the state uh, that were, were perceived after the uh, 1979 uh, insurrection in Mecca, the Soviet extensions after Afghanistan, 
um, and the Iranian uh, Revolution. Um, so uh, there is something happening in a way, uh, clearly, that uh, Saudi Arabia is dealing with foreign policy or how it extends itself and, and its use of Islam is something uh, previously integration schemes were not something the state was interested in at all so up to the 1960s but things have shifted from 1960 and then there's a, 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 an, even, an intensification of this let's say from the 1980s. Um, so you find that um, from the 1990s in the way that people are discussing uh, Saudi foreign policy, um, Salafism isn't really even mentioned in the early 1990s, um, talking in, in English. If you look at Olivier Roy's book, uh, Failure of Political Islam, he doesn't really consider Salafism the term of relevance for something that Saudi Arabia is projecting. Um, in Raymond Hinnebush's book, uh, International Politics and the Middle East, in two, from the 2003 version, again, there's, there's no mention at all, but 2015, there's a difference. He's discussing how, how Saudi Arabia is using Salafism, how it uses groups in Egypt and Syria. So there's some kind of shift that's happening within Saudi Arabia, which is filtering out eventually into the way it's discussed in English. Um, now, the uh, one particular example of this that um, I have been looking at is um, somewhere that isn't discussed that often when we think of where uh, Salafism has gone in this era of discussion of transnational Salafism. But in Turkey, there has been a uh, certain shift that have happened within the country. Um, Turkey isn't is essentially absent from the literature on transnational Salafism, um, but from 1980, when there was a coup that year in Turkey, um, something does happen. The uh, military regime has a different approach towards uh, religion, and it has a different approach towards Saudi Arabia as well. Um, it begins to look towards Saudi Arabia as a as a representative of something conservative in religious sense, which would help against various threats, whether the left or Iran, or even political Islam from within Turkey. Um, uh, the military authorities, they increase their spending uh, on the Religious Affairs Administration. Um, Turkey becomes much more active in um, international Islamic organizations that um, are linked to Saudi Arabia. Um, and also uh, the World Muslim League, um, specifically, uh, in, it funds the Religious Affairs Administration in, in Turkey to send officials to Europe to engage in proselytization to, well, amongst the Turkish communities. Um, you also have a, a network of preachers who had studied in um, Saudi Arabia at the Islamic University of Medina, um, who apply the Salafi designation, uh, who come back, uh, they establish their fund, uh, publishing houses and charity organizations. Um, they're allowed to do this. At a point in the late 1990s, they are harassed to a certain degree, sometimes they're in prison, um, but when you get up to 2007, when the AKP has been in power for a couple of years, 2007 is that year when they uh, outfox the military essentially for the first time, um, when Abdullah Gul manages to become the president. Things change from that point onwards, and they're uh, they're not treated um, uh, they're not treated even in a neutral manner. They're treated quite positively. Um, they now come online. They're on social media. They have their, they have websites. Um, they are very aggressively putting forward. Um, their view. But what they're doing is, is engaging in a translation project, essentially. They're taking texts from Saudi Arabia by these major scholars like Ben Baz, Albani, Al Fawzan, Ibn al Thaymin, and they're translating them into Turkish, or they're just putting them in Arabic within, within Turkey. Now, one of the most interesting figures amongst them, I find, is uh, Abdullah Yolju. Um, I would say he's the most uh, established of them. He has his publishing house, uh, Goraba, uh, which has been in Istanbul since 1992, so it's, uh, it's uh, a certain vintage within this scene. Um, he ha himself uh, worked in Saudi Arabia quite a bit. Uh, he has books published in Arabic before, so he's not only publishing these books by the Saudi scholars, he's publishing his own work as well and putting it into Turkish. Um, the, the, the themes are uh, the kind of standard themes you would expect, the, the kind of Salafi corrective to Asharism Ash regarding faith and action, uh, the dangers to the, the one's faith of not praying, not fasting, over friendly relations with non-Muslims, the dangers of visiting shrines, music, the general kind of laxity of the, uh, the post-Sharia believer, let's say, um, in, in the Salafi view. Um, but what's interesting is the choices that um, they make in terms of uh, the works that they're translating from Turkish and putting into Arabic, um, what, they, what they do choose, what they don't choose, um, in particular, when they're discussing uh, Sufism and shrines and music, 
you find that they're, 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 they're crafting what they take into, uh, from Arabic into this Turkish discourse, which uh, speaks in a certain way to Turkish audiences in, in a way that it might not even in Arabic. So that when they're discussing, when there's a discussion of uh, the prohibitions, certain prohibitions on listening to music or what kinds of music and what contexts, um, which in Arabic is this discussion about sama, when it's, in, when it's sima in Turkish, a reader might understand it referring to uh, alevis. Um, similar with uh, Rawafid or Rafida, uh, referring to Shia in Arabic, when it comes out as Rafazila in Turkish, it might also make you think of Alevis. The same with uh, when discussing, say, Bataniya, then Batanila might also have that implication. Um, and and, and in fruit, fruit notes are used quite a bit as well to, to link what is there and what was in Arabic to uh, a certain kind of context in Turkey. Um, so I think that. In, in Roe Mayer's book on in global salafism, he, he talks about the situations where the quietest current, is, as he terms it, can find a niche, or it can find a niche, uh, or uh, in certain uh, situations, the quietest current can, or if a national movement has failed. I think uh, what he says there speaks um, quite well to the Turkish case because they have managed to find a niche, and it is very much quietest in the sense that they're not challenging the authority of the. The, the ruler in any way whatsoever, that's something that doesn't feature at all in, in um, the discourse you get in Yolji's work and the others as well. Um, so I think what you see is um, uh, through Yolji and these others, um, they're producing a Turkish selfism from Arabic texts and it speaks very much to the Turkish experience of uh, secular materialism. Um, so uh, just in conclusion, I think um, the idea of uh, Salafism as something timeless, or timeless Salafism is a Khaled of the way I termed it. Um, I think it's been challenged uh, quite effectively in the last couple of years. Um, but I, uh, and so that we have a sense of it as, as really an inventive tradition of the early 20th century, um, an amalgamation of trends that didn't themselves use this de designation to identify, self identify. But I think that its elaboration and uh, contemporary understanding is perhaps of even more provenance than we think. And it wasn't really until 1960 Saudi Arabia and Albania that it really becomes uh, something that we would, we would recognize today. Um, and I think while state Wahhabia retains its reservations, it has been useful in staking hegemonic claims over Sunni Islam globally, it supersedes the use of the word Wahhabism, and it helps in what we could call foreign policy. Um, uh, Henri Lozier, when he when he discusses uh, these three groups um, that I mentioned, I think we could say are the, the term is a rubric that covers all three in the early 20th century. He kind of privileges the um, anti schools group, uh, the anti taqlid group, um, as somehow kind of the true Salafis or more deserving of the term than the others. Um, I think. It seems to me that's more um, a reflection of the success of that particular group from the 1960s in embracing the term and in promoting the term. Um, I think state Wahhabism, Wahhabism was never fully at ease with, uh, with the group or the terminology. Um, but uh, one of the advantages of, its, of, the, uh, of it was it, bec it became intrinsic to new understandings of uh, normative uh, Sunni Islam and then the branding of uh, Islamic uh, themes in uh, foreign policy. Um, thank you. Oh, all right, okay, thank you. Well, I'll stop there. And that was pretty much it. So, thank you. Thank you.